and cross-examines the softest, most pointless cross-examination anyone will ever see from a criminal barrister. Uh, today, we have got Marnie Riches. Uh, in fact, I'm going to stop myself and say, Marnie, is that how I pronounce your name? I should have asked this already. It is, Marnie yeah. Riches. Riches, it is. Riches rhymes with bitches. Riches rhymes with bitches. I should have definitely asked that before, shouldn't I? <laughs> uh, yes, today we've got, Mar <laughs> so we've got Marnie Riches, who is the author of, amongst other things, the George McKenzie series, uh, and now the D.I. Beverly Saunders series, uh, which includes Tightrope and Backlash. Uh, Marnie has been called the uh, Martina Cole of the North, which is high praise indeed, but very well deserved. I wish. <laughs> well, uh, there's a difference in the, between the sales and between the, uh, the quality of what's being written. Um, hopefully the sales will follow because they're very well deserved. So Marnie, thanks very much for agreeing to come on and have a chat. Thanks for having me. Uh, you're more than welcome. So we're talking, uh, I just was talking about BI, uh, PI, uh, Beverly Saunders, a private investigator, Beverly yeah. Saunders. She's your new series character. She is, yeah. Um, she's she's a northerner like me, but unlike me, she's um, she, she likes to take a walk on the wild side, does Bev. So she's a recent divorcee uh, and she's had to abandon her glittering career as a marketing executive in London because her, um, her ex-husband, Rob the Knob, has blackened her name. And uh, so she moves back up north and ends up um, living in this squalid, damp basement flat of her posh friend Sophie in Hale, which is uh, Cheshire's football belt, famous uh, for where all the Man U and Man City players live. Um, and uh, Bev um, sets herself up as a private investigator because she decides that's something that she can just start doing. Oh with little uh, with little qualification at first, and uh, and takes on the case of Angela Fitzwilliam, who is the battered wife of a cabinet minister. Um, and, and that's, uh, that, that's tightrope. That's tightrope, yeah, that's how it starts. But Bev's um, got a penchant for sex clubs. Uh, okay. When she needs to scratch that particular itch, uh, she, she goes and does all sorts of stuff that during my divorce, I never did. But um, it is based on some of the more lurid, tolls, uh, lurid tales that friends have told me. It's just sounding, if you don't mind me saying, it sounds like somebody has taken sort of uh, the same sort of inspiration as Agatha Raisin and taken it in a very, very different direction. Well, I don't know about that, but um, <laughs> my editor said to me, um, oh, oh, you should uh, come up with a PI, but put some sex in it. And, and Bev was born. <laughs> and, and so you did. <laughs> And Backlash is the most recent uh, that came out in January. Yes, that's right. That's the second Bev book. And there you see uh, Bev's relationship with her sidekick, Doc, who's a computer geek. So he's an Oxford graduate um, that has got a weed farm in his loft and a bit of a criminal record. But he's, he's essentially extremely bright, a really good hacker, um, and uh, but has dubious personal hygiene and taste in Iron Maiden t-shirts. But so him and her are an unlikely duo and they're both camped out in their um, shared office above a charity shop in Altrincham. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I have to admit, I haven't read them, but I really need to. I, I really want to now, especially intrigued. You said Rob the Knob was her previous, was her husband. Yeah. And I think in Backlash, there's a character called Anthony Anthony, um, whose nickname yeah, is Two well, Tone. <laughs> he's one of the villains, yeah. So good, so bad they named him twice. So, yes. yeah, he's Two Tone. And he's, uh, I, I've, I've not seen in crime fiction before um, kind of manual labourers depicted as major characters. And he's, he's a landscaper and he's, he's a self made man and really very wealthy. And uh, he lives in, in a Pennine village which a lot, a lot of really successful builders do live around that sort of Rochdale and Oldham area um, and going up into sort of on the, on the way to West Yorkshire. And, um, you know, they're extremely well healed and very good at what they do, but they're, they're not necessarily, you know, the middle classes wouldn't consider them to have much finesse. And Two-Tone is a fabulous character. It's a fabulous um, name. I just love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Anthony Anthony. But he, he lives on this kind of leafy well-heeled cul-de-sac in this Pennine village and he gets right on his neighbour's tits and <laughs> Bev is tasked by um, kind of fusty piano tuner Jim Higson and his wife Penny. Um, she's she's tasked with investigating him for dirt because he's such an antisocial neighbour 
and and Bev then uncovers this kind of litany of uh, organised crime and, and shenanigans and a dog, a giant of a dog, a marauding dog. So, well, it's, it's really interesting to hear because given what I do for my day job, um, I you know I encounter a lot of people who would probably be the real life versions of Anthony Anthony. And it is true that they do live in these very genteel, very lovely world healed areas. Yeah. I mean, I, I've got one particular um, client or former client and repeatedly former client who lives on the Wentworth estate and right. is driving around in his old battered pickup truck. It's probably worth more than everybody else on that estate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but he's driving around old battered pickup truck. There's always straw on his jumpers. <laughs> and then, yeah. and it's just this enormous human being. Uh, and they hate him. They absolutely hate him there because um, I, I guess they've got a, a, they probably don't have a vague idea of what he really is, but they have an yeah. idea, their own idea of what he is, which is probably very wrong. Yeah, well, th there's a few around here. I mean, I live in the cheap seats of Hale and um, it, it is Hale, the, the sort of triangle of Hale, Wilmslow and Alderley Edge. It, it's the nicest bit to live outside mm. London and South East area. Um, and it's very costly as well, although, like I said, I live in, in the cheap seats and um, and I managed to get this far up the property ladder, although I only live in a, a kind of shitty extended bungalow. Well, it's not shitty, but it's nice extended bungalow because I, I've um, done property development on the side for years. So not only have I ended up with a, with a really good um familiarity with all the trades and stuff but you also hear these lurid tales of crime bosses that live around here and to all intents and purposes you know they're kind of over finch range rovers are, are indistinguish and their trophy wives are indistinguishable from the you know the solicitors and the consultants and yeah. you know the kind of intelligentsia that live in the area or the old money uh, but when you scratch the surface they've usually got some connection to kind of you know the manchester days when uh E started being a thing yeah. and Manchester drug culture really mushroomed. <clears throat> so I'm not going to name names, but <laughs> Bad, Born Bad and the cover up. Um, so Born Bad was my Manchester Gangland book and it was featured in CBS's Written in Blood documentary. And that was that, you know, it was all inspired by Manchester drug wars and turf wars over the years, which are still ongoing. But, you know, the bosses, they live in lovely houses. They don't rough it. On a Withenshaw or no, no. Well, my, my, my father-in-law is a, you said about housing development, my father-in-law is, is a fairly well-known um, interior designer. Um, he make, His name's Clive Christian, makes the kitchens and all those things. Um, and yeah, I would imagine that he has a huge, because he's, he's from Cheshire, and I imagine he has a huge variety of clients up there, which are either footballers yeah. or people whose money comes from somewhere else. <laughs> Well, exactly. You know, where else is it going to be coming from? I mean, I know Manchester's a, a good economic centre, but there's not the same uh, opp legitimate opportunities there is in London. Yeah. And why wouldn't kids from rough estates, which I grew up on a very rough estate in Cheatham, as, as some readers will know, why wouldn't they if they've got a bit of wherewithal and ambition, but not academic now saw opportunity? Why wouldn't they build an empire for themselves doing yeah. a bit of this and a bit of that? Ducking and diving, my mother used yeah. to call it. Well, I think we've, we've probably come across quite a lot of the same people. <laughs> I have done a fair bit of work up in Manchester. It's, uh, it's well, one I, of the f I am not going to judge because I don't fancy <laughs> anyone appearing in my front garden with a sawn off shotgun tomorrow morning. So. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll never tell them where you live. So um, that, that's, we've done the Beverly Saunders books, but also the George McKenzie books. They're the ones that have, uh, and they're the ones that you've really got the reputation as uh, as nor the Northern Martina Cole, aren't they? Well, it would, well, funnily enough, no, it was Born Bad and, and okay. the cover up the Manchester Gangland stuff that started me on that path. But the George McKenzie series, which started with The Girl Who Wouldn't Die, that was my debut and I won an award for it. I won a Dead Good Reader Award in 2015. And um, it went on to be um, a, a Kindle top 50 bestseller. And, um, you know, I mean, I've sold you know a couple of hundred thousand that that's the bulk of that and the born bad thingy with the bulk of my sales so far yeah and um george mckenzie she's it's 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 part autobiographical that series in the sense that george mckenzie is a working class girl that went to cambridge 
except she did sociology and was an aspiring criminologist. So the first book starts with her on an Erasmus year in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. Um, and I did, I was a, a council state kid who did German and Dutch at Cambridge University. And I spent a year in Utrecht, just south of Amsterdam. Um, and of course, I'm interested in criminology and, and trafficking, which is the overarching theme of that series. Um, so although George is not like me, uh, in the sense that, you know, she's young and energetic and she's a criminologist, she's also black, which clearly I'm not, but that was, you know, I started, I wrote that series. The first book was written in 2009, which was before the whole debate about um, cultural appropriation. I, I was one of a, a group of people who were just trying to get divo yeah. diverse voices heard. And I was trying to do that in my day job at the grassroots literary organisation, Common Word. Um, so, you know, it came from a good place. Right, well, I have to say, not to cut across you, but I don't agree with all of this business anyway. Yeah, if, if, if we don't write um, yeah. other ethnicities and minorities, and they're not yeah. writing, well, then they don't appear in fiction. So well, I, either we... either. <laughs> She was very carefully researched, and I'm from a white ethnic minority background, so you've got that whole mm. extended family shouty nonsense, you know, the kind of drama. Yeah. It's, it's a similar cultural thing and a lot a lot of good food. Yeah. Well, listen, you're, you're, you're writing it from the best possible place, and it's just, uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's a distraction, isn't it? It's a distraction that, that, that the other thing you just don't need. Well, I, I, I would hate to see a white out in, in any fiction yeah. just because people were scared um to well certainly writing about the northwest you manchester you absolutely can't have an all white of course yeah in your book because manchester's not like that well it's like watching it's eastenders not... isn't it you look at eastenders and they have a couple of token asian families oh it's absolutely it's ridiculous. absolutely insane the EastEnders predominantly asian <laughs> exactly yeah and um and certainly southeast london where george is from in the george mckenzie books you know, she's meant to come from Catford, and I used to live in Surrey Keys and Deptford, and yeah. you know, it's mainly, well, I would say half and half white and and black and minority ethnic. Uh, so maybe why, less. Why so. would you write? Why wouldn't you have a a black heroine? Well, she's mm. mixed race actually, but why wouldn't you? You know, who's from uh, Jamaican descent? Because yeah. that's typical. Of the the suggestion that you're not allowed. I mean, what we, we're writing fiction, we're making it all up. None of them are real. Yeah. So what's? It, it's crazy. It's. Uh, it's it's a, well, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky debate. I think I think it's one that's much more sensitively um, felt in the states. They get really itchy scratchy over the subject of cultural appropriation. But as I said, you know, writing back in two thousand nine and ten, you know, I I partnered up with Puffin and RCW to um, start the Diversity in Children's Fiction Award because there was just nothing then. Yeah, and now now there's lots of writers coming through like um, Abby Mukherjee and. Um, I'm at I'm at AA Dan and yeah. um, you know yeah, Emra Emra Mood and those guys, yeah. Yeah, not so many black there. No, uh, uh, it's just, it's a similar thing in law, you know. Just that there's an awful lot of Asian barristers now. A lot of I mean, female yeah. barristers more than male, but not a huge amount of black barristers. I mean, no. we, we 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 could get very diverted onto that. I've just noticed the time. We've only got 15 minutes because I'm trying to get this on Instagram. So we're yeah. now on. Uh, we've got one and a half minutes left. We so can what are you working on? The earnest stuff, and I can tell you <laughs> how I shaved my armpits, my chest hair. So. <laughs> uh, let, let's avoid that, and let's, let's see what you're working on at the moment. Let's try and get that in there quickly. Ah, well, I'm I'm putting some uh, final touches to a, a novel I've written. Um, that, well, it's it's a, it's a serial killer thriller, but with a with a real difference, and I. Yeah, I can't actually talk too much about that. It's no, kind fine. of top secret at the moment, and it's just me and my agent have seen it. Um, but that that I was working on over the winter, and it's ready to um, to go to you know acquisitions yeah. teams. Um, and in June, I believe I've got a historical saga coming out about the birth of the NHS under a pseudonym Maggie Campbell. So I've been busy on a range of uh, projects over the last 12 months, not all of which are crime. Well, I can't wait to read them. can't wait to see all of them. Um, yeah. I'm, I've got more questions, but we're running out of time, so I'm going to have to go. Uh, Marty, thank you very much. Thanks for taking the time today, and we'll see you soon. All right. Thanks for having me. Take thanks care. Thanks a lot. Bye. bye.